Welcome back to Ox Tools. I'm Tom. So, uh, Happy New Year to everybody. This is the first meatloaf episode of 2014. And I just wanted to thank everybody for uh, all their comments and support. And uh, it's just amazing to me that uh, the people are interested in this stuff uh, so strongly. And uh, I get such a positive response back from all you guys. And I really appreciate it. And I just want to let you guys know that. Um, so, we got this uh, meatloaf episode here. We got a few things to talk about. Uh, I got a couple of tools that we're going to talk about. The guys have asked about the tapping blocks that they've seen me use. Um, and uh, a couple of hammers uh, came up in some, uh, some discussions. Guys wanted to see a couple of hammers. Um, and then uh, some folks have been asking about uh, countersinks and how to sharpen countersinks and how to deal with countersinks. So I got a couple of, a couple of twists on that. And um, let's see, what else? Um, the, uh, oh, and then, excuse me, the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, um, I get a fair amount of questions about uh, uh, new, new lathe users. Um, they, uh, they ask questions, and, uh, which is fine. I don't mind the questions. Um, but a lot, many times what I tell them is to uh, just go out and buy this particular book here. And what this is, this is the this is the quintessential classic text on how to run a lathe, and that's the title of it. And it's put out by uh, South Bend Lathe Company, and it covers, uh, you know, and I think the first edition came out in 1915, and uh, and the, I don't know when the last edition was, but it's it's virtually unchanged since then. Um, but it's still pertinent to lathe operations, and. Uh, so it answers a lot of those, uh, uh, those basic questions that come up about tool bits and cutting speeds and tapers and, and threading and tool, you know, all, all, those, all those questions that people have. And the beauty of it, the beauty of the book format is that it's indexed, okay? Unlike, now there's tons of videos out there too of basic stuff, how to grind a threading tool, how to do single point threading, how to neural, how to do this, how to do that. Um, which is all in here, um, but they're not indexed very well. So unless the person is stuck to a single subject, right, um, it's hard to find it in the in the video world. So uh, uh, and you have to watch a lot of videos, and uh, and you have to go back if you have a if you have a question or a new question comes up. Anyway, uh, what's nice about a book format is it is it is indexed, and you can look at it any time. And you can go to a particular section and and keep that there while you're while you're actually running the machine. Um, so anyway, this book is still readily available. It's uh, less than ten dollars, and anybody that buys a lathe, uh, even a hobby lathe, just go buy this book. It, just trust me on this. Uh, it will answer uh, questions you didn't even know you had. Okay, <clears throat> so. Uh, um, eBay has them. Uh, you can probably find them on Amazon or Abbey Books or, uh, or one of the used book sites. Uh, uh, I usually keep a few copies around uh, myself, and uh, that you know, when somebody has a question, I just hand them the book. So, anyway, let's uh, let's suit up. Let's look at some tools. Let's uh, uh, grind some countersinks, and uh, let's have some fun. All right, let's get going. Okay, so what we got here is a selection of tapping blocks. And um, these are ones that, uh, you know, I've collected over the years and um, uh, made. Um, this, one's pro this one's the oldest I have here. It's actually pretty worn out. I should probably uh, um, re-drill some of the holes. And this is this plain cold rolled steel, same here. This particular one's heat treated. I got this one at a flea market. Um, I think this is some kind of jewelry makers thing here, but uh, some taps fit those holes pretty good and um, uh, it was nicely made. So um, anyway, <laughs> excuse me. And then this is another little homemade one here and I'll show you in a sec. So a few guys have asked me about these and the way these are used is, uh, um, let's just grab a nominal tap here. Um, you know, you, you've drilled your, whoops, all right, sorry about that, uh, 
Somebody knocked at the door there. So, okay. Um, so anyway, uh, the way these work is, you know, you've drilled your tap, uh, your hole in whatever it is that you want to tap. And then um, the idea here is that this sits on that surface, okay? And that hole is perpendicular to that surface. And let's find the right hole here. And the tap passes through with enough threads that you can, uh, um, you can tap pretty much as deep as you want. And then, now these are not a tight fit here, okay? Because you get chips on there, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just gonna wiggle this so you can get an idea of how, uh, you know, the, the clearance. I'd say there's, uh, you know, five, five or six thousandths clearance or something between those two holes, or excuse me, between the tap and the, uh, the tap body and the hole. You know, it wants to go through there uh, nice and easy, right? You don't want it to resist. And then, you know, you, you, know, you tap, uh, you hold this flat on the surface and then you tap. You guys have seen me use these before. Um, and then, you know, these are just your different tap drill sizes. And, you know, sometimes you can bolt these on too if, uh, if you, you know, you need both hands for tapping or something like that. Uh, or you can put a clamp on it to, to hold it in place. Now this one goes from, what is that? That's the 10, that's eight. It's probably four, eight, 10. Uh, we usually skip six on these uh, just cause uh, number six is kind of a sketchy size. Um, and then quarter, blah, 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 up to half inch on this one. Um, and this one's just a slightly different size, a little different form factor. Um, this one here, let's see. Yeah, it's got a couple holes that fit pretty good. This one's a little thinner, which sometimes is nice, you know, if you want to reach or, you know, I don't know what, go through something different. Um, and then this little guy here, this is this one that's made out of a piece of flat bar that I surface ground. Uh, parallel and that one fits a, a very small tap um, it's a two, I think it's a 256 um, is what I was tapping with that one yeah and it needs to be thinner because you know proportionally the the tap is is got less threads anyway so you can hold that down and then uh, hand tap and be nice and square with the world uh, um, you know when you're hand tapping there okay is you don't always, you can't always get the thing in the machine, all right? It's just the way it is. And um, so sometimes you need to create a little, uh, a little drilling and tapping fixture uh, so you can do a nice job um, when you can't get the machine at that particular hole. So you have to have tricks for that, okay? Anyway, some guys wanted to see those, and uh, there they are, the different styles. Um, just to throw some sizes on these things. Uh, that one's three inches in diameter. Let's, uh, let me get my uh, handy dandy here. So that's three inches, uh, 75 millimeters. This is a hexagon here, and uh, it's inch and three quarters, 45 millimeters. Um, thickness wise, what is that? That's, uh, that's an inch, 25 millimeters. Um, this one I think is, yeah, that's an inch too, another 25 millimeters. And this little guy here is, uh, 15 millimeters thick and one and three quarter also that's interesting huh okay anyway just a coincidence all right there it is okay so the next thing we got here a um, couple guys have asked about um, some specific hammers uh, that they've seen in uh, some videos um, and another guy uh, named Nick uh, asked gee why do you have so many hammers and uh, so my response was uh, you know, some people collect music and uh, handbags and um, uh, sunglasses. I collect tools, and uh, so the hammers are just something that I like and uh, that are pleasing. Anyway, uh, Nick asked uh, about. Um, well, actually, another guy asked about the uh, this hammer here, and this is a uh, a Birkeland uh, NAF thirty eight thousand uh, is the part number, and uh, it's kind of an interesting little hammer. And I used it the other day. Um, what were we doing? Oh, we uh, swaged that uh, that little uh, brass tube with this, and I picked it uh, mainly because it had um, um, a copper face on it. I just grabbed it out of the rack, and um, um, so it has a copper face on one side and a and a hard steel face on the other. So it's kind of interesting that way. And I think this is listed as they call it a farrier's hammer, and it is kind of um, that. 
style, you know, the same kind of head on either side uh, with typically different curvatures, slightly different curvatures in a farrier's hammer, uh, which I don't have one, by the way, uh, that I w or otherwise I would show it to you. Uh, but this one has a replaceable copper face on one side, uh, which is kind of nice. And this is great for, for punching um, because uh, the punch, as you can see, bites into that surface and doesn't want to skate off, which is kind of neat. And then, uh, and then you got a, a regular hard surface here that you can work with. So that's the, the Birkeland hammer there that's kind of neat. And then uh, the one that Nick uh, wanted to see was this little guy here. And this is, I think, my smallest ball-peen hammer here, okay? And I don't know what the weight is. I haven't weighed it. It's not listed on it. Um, but it's just, a, it's just a beautiful little hammer, okay? This is one of my favorite hammers. I don't use it very much. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes it's the right thing. Now, this particular one's not forged, I don't think. It's machined. I can see some machining marks in it. So this would actually be a really neat little uh, machining project for folks. You know, you can make a nice handle and, and machine a nice little head and, uh, you know, a stylish little head like that and cut a tapered socket in there and do the whole, the whole nine yards, which would make a neat little project. Um, anyway, um, uh, what's what I think is spectacular about this particular hammer is the thinness of of the handle and this is an original handle uh, I'm pretty sure uh, and it's a uh, you know I thought it was a, uh, a plum tools uh, but it's a uh, PNC and uh, 1302 and made in the USA uh, and this is kind of classic of the ha hammers in the in the 40s and 50s. This kind of octagonal, uh, tapered octagonal thing here in the green paint. Um, so this thing is, you know, is basically brand new. It's pretty neat. Um, so this is good for, you know, just light tapping and it's small and it gets into little places and all that. And uh, like I said, I don't use it very much, but I sure like looking at it, okay? So anyway, that's a, a hammer for uh, that Nick and I were talking about, kind of offline there, um, uh, that he wanted to see. So uh, we we coaxed her out of the toolbox, and uh, now we're going to put her away and uh, um, and uh, very gingerly. Okay, so here we've got some um, some single flute countersinks, and um, some guys were asking about about sharpening these. Okay, and. These are actually kind of hard to sharpen, um, and the way they have a funny relief on them. They're relieved from this way, from this cutting edge back, um, kind of eccentrically. So what I mean by that is, um, like a drill bit, this edge is higher than this edge here. So it's basically tapering as it comes back around. So there's more and more and more and more relief. Although the relief is very shallow on these countersinks, which is why they're difficult to sharpen. So theoretically, you could sharpen these kind of like a drill bit, um, but pretty quickly you, you, you mess with that relief and then they don't work right anymore, okay? So in my experience, these are, these are kind of tricky to, uh, to sharpen. They're they're normally sharpened on a some kind of eccentric fixture that uh, that drives them in and rotates them and 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 pushes them into the wheel or takes them out of the wheel uh, um, the the right amount. I don't know what the the relief angle is there, although maybe we can uh, maybe we can check that and uh, so I can demonstrate that. Um, so the only way I've really had success sharpening these particular guys. And this one shows some signs of some uh, some monkey wrench in there, is to work on this internal edge here. Okay, um, and this is it. It's helically helical ground, so it's not something you're going to be able to do by hand uh, properly. Uh, although you can do kind of a facsimile of it uh, by, and we'll go over to the grinder and I'll show you how you might stick that on the grinding wheel to, to kind of work that edge. Now this might be a real good. Um, um, job for a small Dremel tool as long as you didn't, you know, so you come in here with a little Dremel tool and you create a little hollow in here uh, and if you can avoid jumping over that edge with the with the tool, the grinding tool, then uh, you can probably tune that up. 
uh, pretty well. Um, and then here's another one here, and this one's been horsed with a little bit too. You can see see some signs there of uh, somebody like myself uh, getting in there and fussing around with that. So we'll go over on the grinder and we'll look at that and uh, see how you can get those up on the grinder and, uh, um, and touch those up a little bit. Um, and you know, the other thing you can do too that's very simple is you can stone these uh, on these internal surfaces here to, uh, to get a little more life on that. But the other thing I want to talk about too here is um, actually, you know what? I'm going to change the camera around a little bit, and uh, we'll um, we'll zoom in on the uh, on the vice and the mill, and we'll talk about the next thing. So, okay, so I got a piece of steel here um, in the mill, and I popped a couple of holes in it just for a demo. And so there's a there's a couple things that you that you do with counter sinks, okay? Um, one of them, one of the things you do with countersinks is you just take the edge off of a hole. Okay, now these have a, a very small burr. They probably have a bigger, yeah, they got a bigger burr underneath, but I don't want to flip it over right now because this piece is kind of rough. Um, so that's one of the things that you do is you, is you just, uh, you know, you come down and, you know what, I'm just going to put it in neutral and then I'll just spin it by hand. So that's one of the things that you do is you just deburr the edge of a hole, okay? Now, one shop that I worked in, um, you know, I noticed that when I got there that, and it was a sheet metal shop, and uh, they punched a lot of holes in, in steel and stainless and all that, and they would deburr them with not a countersink, but what they would use is they would use a drill. Um, so what they would do is just uh, um, use a... Uh, hopefully I can get that in there. Nope. Okay. They would use a a drill that was slightly larger, and they would come down and just just kiss that edge and deburr it. Okay. Now I kind of did a little too much there, but uh, um, but that's the general idea. You would just come down and so I said, you know, I said to the foreman, I said, geez, you know, how come you guys don't use countersinks, right? You know, uh, you know, you get a specific angle, you can get this nice low angle and knock those burrs off. He goes, well, he says there's a good reason because a lot of the holes that we do are all the same size and they were 1332. There was gajillions of 1332 holes. So his point was that what happens is the countersink wears out, right, where 1332 diameter intersects that edge, right? So the rest of this is fine, but right at that, that particular diameter, it's the thing's wasted. And he says, and the countersinks are expensive, blah, 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 and they wear out right at that one spot. And then drills are easy to touch up, even for um, beginners, okay? So that's the thing that, that I wanted to, to talk about, too, was, yeah, you can use standard countersinks, right? And they're real nice, and they don't chatter, and they, uh, which is the, the claim to fame for these single flute guys. They don't chatter uh, as much as drills do uh, when doing those kinds of operations. Um, but you can also use drills as countersinks too. And, uh, and I'm gonna demonstrate that because what I did was I went ahead, now this is, uh, this is 82 degree uh, included angle, okay? And uh, so what I did was I went ahead and I, I, had, I got an old drill bit and I sharpened it to that same angle, okay? And this is just using, you know, standard uh, um, drill grinding techniques and a little protractor. Uh, what I did was I went ahead and ground that uh, to uh, the countersink angle. So what we're going to do, just to kind of show, actually, you know what, let's do, the, let's do the countersink first. Okay, and just a point of reference too is with these single flute ones, um, um, they tend to want to push off center, okay? So for best results, and I'm not gonna do it here, but for best results, put these in a collet. Don't put them in a chuck. Chuck them right in the collet and you'll get much better results with them. Uh, you'll get much nicer uh, countersinks and you won't see that, that kind of wobbling. Uh, you know, we're hanging out pretty far from the, um, from, um, the collet, so we get a little bit of deflection, uh, tool deflection, okay? It's just the way it is, okay? Okay, so always run your countersinks real slow so they last forever, basically. 
all right and a little oil is always good so we're just going to countersink in a little bit let's see if i'm lucky i got a screw flip in there Okay, I got a screw. Okay, and, and here I'm just checking the diameter here, okay, by putting the screw in backwards, and that looks pretty close. I'm gonna go a little more, like that, okay. All right, so everybody, you know, la di da, right? Okay, it's a countersink, right? Bingo, done. Okay, so that's with a standard MA Ford type or Uniflute, some people call them, uh, single flute countersink. So now we're going to put my scary looking drill in there and you can see the grind there and I just relieved the backside a little bit. Okay, we're going to put that in now. Okay, I'm going to move back to the fresh hole here, which was at some number. Yeah, okay, something there. All right, same thing, we're going to run it slow. Now I can already feel that it, it wants to chatter a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna slow that down. All right, and what I did was I locked the quill just a little bit. All right, it actually looks pretty good right there. Let's, uh, okay, so it looks like I went a little deep on that one. Okay, countersink, all right, so now, let's, let me blow that off. All right. And let's just look at our, our hole quality here. So this one, it's got some little, little marks in it, um, little chatter marks, okay? Like I said, I could feel it's wanting to chatter. This one looks pretty darn good here, okay? But they're countersinks, okay? So, uh, um, if you put this in a collet and um, pecked against the stop or whatever, you'd probably get similar results to that and maybe you can um, um, fiddle with the grind a little bit and hone it um, and, um, and get rid of that chatter. Um, okay, so the illustration there is you can make your own countersink any angle you want. You can chamfer the edges of holes with oversized drills, okay? And the last thing we're gonna show is uh, we're gonna go over and uh, touch up one of these uniflutes on the uh, on the bench grinder. <laughs> we're gonna attempt to, and then we'll, uh, we'll try that on our, uh, on our last hole there and, uh, and see what we get, okay? Okay, so we're over here on the, on the bench grinder, and uh, here's our <laughs> countersink victim. <laughs> And we'll just do it. I'll show you what I'm going to do um, before uh, I turn the wheel on. But we're going to come in like this very carefully here. And we just want to basically catch this inner edge here. So I'm just going to kind of roll it something like that to, to touch that edge up internally. And I'm I'm creating a more positive edge there and just taking a tiny bit off of um, off of the leading edge okay so let's uh, let's color that in so we can uh, see what we're doing there uh, or see what I'm doing <laughs> all right um, yeah we don't need any on that edge here all right it's our uh, poor man's uh, dicum there. Okay, so let's, uh, yeah, that's better. Let's see how that camera looks. Oh, actually, you know what? That's kind of washing it out a little bit. I still want to be able to see there. Hmm. All right, let's uh, back this up a little bit. Let's try that. Okay, that's not too bad. Okay, here we go. I don't want to nick anything coming in here. You know what? I got to I got to go get my uh, my magnifier here.
Alright, there we go. Okay, that's it. I'm stopping. Didn't quite catch the tip there, but you never use it down there anyway. Okay, so let's uh, let's go with that. Let's go give it a try and see how it behaves. All right, we're back on the mill here with our um, with our touched up uh, countersink. Now this one wasn't too bad before, but uh, let's see how it does. Um, uh, now with a fresh grind on it. All right, a little lube on there. Let's see what we got. Yeah. Looks pretty tasty to me. Feels good. Looks like a countersink. Okay. Anyway, uh, there's uh, chips look okay. Uh, I would probably hone that a little bit. Um, yeah, there's a little wire edge on there that probably needs to come off, and I would probably hone that with a uh, with an abrasive stone, uh, just a little bit, just to smooth that. But you can see um, that these uniflutes generally produce a uh, a better finish than a two flute tool or a multi flute tool um, does. And then just to review, there's our, uh, our crazy looking drill there, uh, which works fine actually. So anyway, countersinks and sharpening them. Um, well, we've been over here uh, playing around on the, uh, on the bench grinder with the countersink. Um, a lot of guys have asked me about um, sharpening drills. And how come I don't have a video of uh, how to sharpen a drill? Well, there's a couple of reasons, and I think they're pretty good reasons. Um, one of them is there's already a bunch of videos on how to sharpen drills, okay? So um, there's plenty of excellent information out there. Adam's got one. Tom's Techniques has one. Uh, Keith Fenner's got one. Tubal Kane's got one. Everybody's got a damn drill sharpening. Not a, a drill sharpening uh, video. So um, I really don't want to mow the same grass um, again. All right. So just understand that uh, it takes practice to freehand grind a drill. Okay. So you can watch videos all day long. Okay. And still not get it. Okay. What you really got to do is you got to go out in the shop and you got to make a lot of dust and you got to grind a lot of drill bits or grind a lot of them shorter um, which is exactly what happened to me when I was many many years ago when I was a teenager uh, I was in my garage farting around doing something and all my drills were dull and I just really got pissed off and decided one day I said hey I, I'm stopping I'm not doing any more work I am going to learn how to sharpen a drill I had a bench grinder you know it was no problem right I'm gonna learn how to sharpen a drill if it's the last thing I do, okay? And I don't care if the drill, you know, is three inches shorter when I'm done, I'm going to figure out how to control this geometry at the end on the bench grinder, okay? So that I can get a sharp drill when I want one, okay? Now, the problem with that is um, I was working in a vacuum, right? I didn't have a old tool maker guy there, uh, uh, you know, in the garage uh, to help me out and tell me what I was doing wrong. And so I did this kind of all on my own. So what actually happened was kind of interesting is that um, the way I learned how to sharpen drills is completely backwards from the way that everybody else shows it, okay? Now, so that's generally why I, I tell people, hey, listen, eh, don't learn the way I do it. You know what? You'll just open yourself up for criticism. People will look at you like you're crazy, okay? And uh, so I've been reluctant to, uh, to kind of show that um, because it is. It's kind of wacky, okay? Uh, but 
it gets results, okay? And you get a sharp drill and the geometry's right, okay? So who cares if, you know, you can stand on your head and do this and if that's the way it works, great. So I started thinking about it and uh, it actually makes some sense to show it because maybe other people are having difficulty with the quote normal method and it would be nice to see an alternate method, okay? So that's how I'm presenting this, is, is an alternate method for sharpening drills. Um, and, uh, you know, and I'll zoom the camera in a little closer and we'll look at it. And I thought what we would do here is this drill that I, uh, that I reground for uh, doing the, uh, the countersinks with a drill bit, uh, I thought we'd just bring this back to normal geometry and uh, so, <laughs> so that it's not a crazy wacky drill sitting in my pile that I accidentally grab and don't pay attention to. So let's zoom in and, uh, and I'll show you what's weird about Tom's method and, uh, and why it's kind of backwards uh, from uh, the rest of the world. Okay? All right. Okay, so here's our, here's our kooky drill that we uh, reground at uh, countersink angles. And um, we're just going to redress this and, uh, and make it a normal uh, 118 degree uh, geometry. Now, let me just, I'll just tell you first what I'm going to do. So, you know, normal humanoids uh, and uh, the rest of the machining world generally sharpen drills, what I call the uphill method, where they come in with the cutting lip here and they, and they do this. They come up and create that back relief, okay? So they start like this and then they come up, okay? Like so, and then they flip it around and repeat and the idea is you keep these lips the same length, okay, and the same angle and all that. Okay, now what, what Tom's method is that's backwards and weird from the rest of the universe is when I learned how to sharpen drill bits, what I always had a hard time with was the back relief, okay? Like you get the, the general angles and the lips the right length, but getting that back relief and the chisel point the way I want, or you know, correct, um, I always had a hard time with. So the, the method that I used, or that I developed or whatever, I don't, I don't even know if you'd call it developed, but discovered, was I do it downhill. So I do it on this side, okay? And I, and I start downhill, and then I do the relief so that I can, I, I work from the relief side so I can see the relief because that's what I had trouble with, okay? And that's what I'm going to show, is, and I call that the downhill method. That's Tom's kooky way, Tom's kooky downhill method, and normal humanoid uh, uh, uphill method. So this is the Martian method, <laughs> and this is the uphill normal method, okay? So uh, let's, let me double check the frame there. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Um, so what I'll do, I'll just, the wheel's got a little bump in it, uh, but I gotta, I gotta knock this down and get the, uh, the angle close, and then, uh, uh, but you'll get to see some of that, uh, some of that action as I, as I do it there. So, um, I don't know, what else? Let's just go for it. So, I've already redressed it there, and that would actually cut, okay? Now, I haven't taken any particular care to make sure the angle's right or anything centered up, but that would actually cut. Uh, you can make a hole with that. So, what I want to do now is I'll redress the wheel a little bit, and then uh, we'll, put our, we'll put our final grind on that, okay? So, my hit, I might block this with my Yeah, that looks pretty good. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, now, you know, I'm doing this all by eye here. I'm not using a drill gauge because I'm just not using a drill gauge. probably actually cut pretty good. Yeah, it looks like that one needs to get moved over a little bit. Good actually. Uh, the devil's in the details, right? So it's real easy to rough it in, but looks pretty good actually that's twisted a little funny but uh all right let's go drill a hole So before we, before we go drill the hole, I went and got a, a, a drill gauge here and I just wanted to, now you, you watch me do that, okay? Now there's no, you know, secret shit going on here with the, uh, the video camera, but that's just by eye, okay? And I'll rotate it around the other side. And this side, it's off a tiny, tiny bit of, on the angle, not much, but the point's pretty centered, okay? And that was just done by eye. So when you sharpen a, a hundred thousand drill bits, okay, you actually kind of get pretty good at looking at the uh, the angles and the geometry there. Uh, and this is just a a little gauge here that uh, that I happen to like. Okay. Okay. So we're gonna try our uh, our eyeball grind here, done the uh, Martian method. This is just some uh, cold rolled steel here. Looks like a hole. Finishing bad. So, um, ouch. A little chip on me there. Um, 
Okay. Anyway, wh what else is there to say? Um, so with practice, uh, you can uh, you can hand grind these effectively um, and quickly.